get underway. We'll try to keep as much as on schedule as we can. I know we got off to a little rough start. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom Rathwaite, uh, who is our moderator of this panel. Tom is known to many people in this room as uh, the business and politics uh, correspondent for the Financial Times. He's based here in Washington, D.C., and where, in fact, he focuses on financial policy issues uh, in the executive branch and also on Capitol Hill. And uh, let me just say broadly, the first panel is Redesigning Financial Regulation, a status report, and it's going to focus uh, clearly on the regulatory process here in the United States through the Dodd-Frank Act, and then take a look at what's happening here in Europe. And if I may just also say yeah. that our next session after that will be focused on assessing international cooperation on financial uh, reform. And that's going to examine the regulatory process globally. So please join me in welcoming uh, Tom and this very distinguished panel. Thanks very much. Uh, it reminds the panel that we've been promised formidable intellects. So, uh, I'm to ask to stand up to the end of the panel, though, no problems for Alan Cooper, Chippel Dell, Doug Elliott from Brookings Institution, Ellie Rasen uh, from Reuters, Vice President of Westfall Business Currents, and to my left, Stuart McIntosh from Group of 30, and to my right, uh, Brian Bussey from the SEC. <coughs> Brian, you were last at the table, presumably because you were just finishing off one of your many rules. Um, since this is a status report and, and you're one of the primary uh, people regulating, filling in uh, the detail of your Frank, just give us a very brief uh, outline of where we are now. Sure. Th thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to be um, here. Uh, first off, I want to start with our standard disclaimer. The views I express here today are my own and not necessarily those of the commission, the chairman, any of the individual commissioners or my colleagues on the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, in terms of status, um, April 27th was a milestone. Um, uh, just a few days ago, um, uh, CFTC uh, completed their uh, proposing phase of uh, Title VII implementation. At that time, uh, SEC and CFTC completed uh, the second of two joint rulemakings on product definitions. Um, and then just last week, we held a joint roundtable on implementation. So as we move into the adoption phase, uh, we're starting to think about um, how, in fact, we implement this. We're not thinking of a big bang when we drop all of these rules on the industry at one uh, time, but we're thinking about how we phase in various requirements and what are the ways to phase in the requirements. The SEC is a, uh, uh, has completed a substantial number of the rulemakings. We're a bit behind the uh, SE, uh, the, our colleagues at the CFTC. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, we've, 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 by and large, completed our clearing rules, our swap data repository rules, our reporting rules, our uh, public dissemination rules in terms of proposing, um, our SEP rules, swap execution facility rules, um, and, and a host of other rules. The areas that we're still working on are the intermediary regulations. So we have proposed definitions for swap dealer and major swap participants, um, but we still have to fill out the regulatory scheme on how we're actually going to regulate those entities in terms of uh, capital, margin, books and records, segregation, external business conduct. Um, we're still um, uh, considering a grab bag of issues in the clearing space um, uh, and, and a couple of other areas. Um, and also very relevant to this uh, gathering today, um, as many of you know, there have been a host of foreign jurisdiction issues that have been raised in the Title VII context. And as my director said at the roundtable last week, um, we're considering how best to address the many issues across the board in Title VII that have been raised um, on the international front whether we do it in a piecemeal fashion, rule by rule, or whether we do something more uh, global um, as, as, as a single effort. Um, and then finally, um, uh, SEC, following the CFTC's lead, um, is thinking seriously about um, an implementation plan um, where we can get input from industry on how best we can implement the provisions that we are responsible for. Now, 
Now, we heard Senator Warner saying delay doesn't make sense, but some of your colleagues and some of those at CFTC say inevitably uh, they're not going to make the deadlines, most of which fall a year after the <coughs> passage of Dodd-Frank in July. But what sort of what sort of thoughts have you got as to when we might uh, see the rules? Well, you know, I'd like to answer that question first, starting with a global perspective. Um, th th there is the G20 statement on derivatives, and that came out in Pittsburgh. Uh, back in September of 2009, and it called for uh, regulation of the derivative space, clearing, reporting, and exchange trading of derivatives. Um, and there's been some confusion, I think, about the, the, the call for implementation. Um, the end 2012 dates is not when the regulators are supposed to be done with their work. If you read the G20 statement, it's actually when industry is supposed to be um, doing what was called for by the G20. In other words, it's a results deadline. It's not a regulatory deadline. Um, we are working very hard to meet the congressional deadline that was uh, set um, last year. I would point out that um, uh, in the final days of the, uh, the uh, effort to conform or to harmonize the Senate and House versions of the Dodd-Frank bill, the bid ask was 180 days and 270 days. So I believe the House was at 180 days to complete all the rulemaking. The Senate was at 270, and Congress ended up at one year. It's, it's actually a really big task, as we've come to learn. We knew going in it was a big task, and we realize now even more what a big task it is. Um, we are very cognizant of the deadlines that Congress has set for us. Um, but we also know and we think Congress appreciates the importance of getting the rules right. And so we have taken a methodical, thorough approach to implementing the requirements um, uh, that have been called for in Dodd-Frank. Um, and, and we're doing that to the best of our ability and um, we will continue to push forward on that basis. Okay, but how, uh, how often do you see other regulators here getting on with implementation? I think realistically, they're doing a good job. They're certainly working all out to do it. Um, I think we have to step back. It's really important to remember that the financial industry, of which I was then a part, and the financial regulators blew up the world. Okay? Really disastrous things happened as a result of where we were. Dodd Frank, as a result, and the rules coming out of Basel as well. Therefore, are very sweeping. We discovered many, many things that needed to be changed, um, and we haven't even touched some like housing finance that are also very important. It was never realistic that this could all be cleaned up in the course of one year following. And I agree with something that the Senator Warner was was pointing out, which is I'm certainly one of the people who didn't want Congress to make all these decisions. You want specialists involved, and the regulators do understand the details much better. Uh, and it also gives more of a chance for back and forth with the industry to figure out what really works and what doesn't. So it was inevitable we were going to have a significant period of uncertainty, and that is bad for the economy. We don't want to prolong it more than it needs to be, so I don't think we want to make some arbitrary additional delay. But I think we also just have to recognize some of these rules can't be done in the original time frames. But I think an ad hoc approach would seem to be what's developed, which is all the regulatory bodies are trying to get all the things done by the deadline to the extent they can. As individual items, it, for individual items, it becomes clear that they can't do a good job in the original time. They're just slowing the deadlines. And I think that's probably the way to go. Alan, um, fresh from blowing up the world, uh, how, um, how does the uncertainty feel to you? I mean, hedge funds are going to be uh, face more reporting requirements. There's the possibility of a designation as a systemically important institution, which would require far more supervision, possibly more capital requirements, and so on. We don't know yet. I mean, how much of the, of the regulatory landscape that you will have to live in is known to you? And how much uh, is that uncertainty causing problems? I think by and large, the uh, hedge fund provisions of Dodd Frank have been uh, uh, plotted by the industry by and large. Regulation reporting are not uh, regimes that are uh, unknown to many participants in the industry and, and are pretty much uh, comfortable with. Um, I'd have to come in and see the SEC in working hard to propose rules, but now pivoting and focusing on what sort of a rational implementation plan does make sense 
because as Doug suggested, a lot of this that existed in 2008 has not left the system. And from our perspective, that specifically means central clearing of derivatives. There are hard rules, there are details to be dealt with, but there is broad consensus with you know, whether the end users are in or out, what's the specific reporting obligation, what is the specific exchange trading sort of platform. There is broad, all of those issues can and should be worked through carefully, but today there is broad consensus around central clearing for derivatives among the most sophisticated and largest participants in the dealer community and financial participants. If you put aside for a moment or work through the other challenging issues, but really what we would urge is today as quickly as possible and on an international basis because there is broad consensus among international regulators similarly that central clearing of derivatives is ready to happen. Today we have the infrastructure, we're not starting from scratch. So our focus really is in, in working through kind of what makes sense in terms of establishing milestones, establishing deliverables, in terms of products that are deliverable, in terms of participants in the market that are ready to go, in terms of the infrastructure that is there today. And, and let's launch what we can launch. And we believe that that will pull forward the other, and, and the right market structure will provide a, a, an environment for the other issues naturally and organically come into being, such as what's the right set structure or what's the right public reporting issue. Uh, Ellie, can I ask you um, how you see things from a compliance perspective and uh, how, how companies are dealing with the, uh, this new world of Dolph Frank? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're actually hearing quite a bit, and I guess by way of background, we focus on many things to do with not only financial regulatory, but also disclosure processes. So we're hearing a lot, not only through the regulatory streams, but the following disclosures. And essentially what we're hearing is, is three main things. It's a tremendous volume, of course, the rule changes, not only in the U.S. under the Dodd Frank um, rubric, but uh, abroad as well, we hear the number of upwards of 60 regulatory changes a day that need to be tracked by our clients, and that's an awful lot of regulations to stay on top of. Each one of these regs can amount to hundreds of pages long. So we heard earlier about some of the Title VII rules that are now being put in place. If you take a look at any single chunk in there, who's regulated, well, what products are being regulated, some of the moving around margin requirements, et cetera, those are each three, 400 page long documents that then have to be built into whatever internal processes are being done. And with the sort of focus now on the 360 day deadline, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what will apply. And you already hear companies talking not only in their own private discussions, but in the very public disclosure documents about, geez, we're not really sure what to do right now, and we really need these rules finished off so that we can know how the game is now to be played. And there are some early signs that companies are picking up on. So if you put the, the uh, trial of uh, the Galleon hedge fund in this context, what you see is that the Rajat Gupta, particularly that particular trial, is a Dodd-Frank story. And it's an early playing out of Dodd-Frank. And there are others in that area as well, because one of the Dodd-Frank changes was SEC got new, new, uh, new powers to pursue administrative proceedings against people who they did not have those abilities to pursue before. And so what we're seeing now is a tremendous amount of uncertainty around all this volume and complexity. But we're also seeing the beginnings of many elements of Dodd-Frank making their way to conduct by companies in the financial industry and beyond. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for those remarks. I think there's been um, already a lot of discussion about uncertainty or the potential for uncertainty. And I, I can only focus on Title VII and Title VIII. Uh, the, those are the two areas that I focus on. We are very focused on the uncertainty issue, uh, and I think we're dealing with it in two different streams. One is this notion of an implementation plan um, where we, we um, give notice or we're thinking about um, something uh, substantial where we're giving notice and ability to uh, uh, comment from industry to actually um, uh, give the industry a sense of how we're planning on rolling, um, rolling out the various requirements before they're effective. Um, the second point is on this July 16th deadline. So in Title VII, um, the, the effective date is July 16th, which I believe is a Saturday. Uh, but there's a special provision in the Title VII. Which is like Title VII essentially derivatives. Title, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we call it T7, actually. I can go even more techy than, <laughs> than I already am. Um, uh, there's a provision in the effective date that says that um, provisions that require rulemaking are not effective on July 16th. And that actually deals with a lot of the provisions in Title VII. So a lot of the provisions are not going to be actually in effect and require compliance on July 16th. But we're also aware of uh, provisions
provisions that may in fact go into effect on July 16th. We've been focusing on that issue and we've been welcoming uh, comments in our meetings with, um, with the public to provide input on areas of concern surrounding July 16th because uh, again, we're very focused on this uncertainty issue and we don't want to cause um, unnecessary uncertainty in uh, either the effective date or the implementation of the derivatives provisions of Dodd-Frank. Stuart, I mentioned one thing sort of around the uncertainty and the phase in the implementation of the 90 day period. There's actually been a lot of debate and discussion about sort of at what point do the rules become effective? What is the 90 days? It is 90 days, but from the man. That, that does create a, a lot of uncertainty. What we would suggest to really facilitate and uh, uh, speed up the implementation is that the agencies announce a date certain by which the clock will start. And I think hope that we agree from these days at the bank. Nothing focuses the mind like a deadline. There's an awful lot of work that needs to be done, for example, to launch a clinic to get ready. And a lot of the debate we heard around the table last week was around how hard it is to document customer accounts, to plug into the facilities. I think if we were to just agree on a date, call it T, there's a very natural T plus three months, six months, nine months, 12 month regime that would then focus the industry on doing what it takes to get uh, launched. Right, it's true, isn't it? It's looking a bit amorphous at the moment, a bit soggy as to what the, uh, what the date is for implementation and what the date is when we're going to have the rules. How are you, uh, can you give them the date? Um, you know, I'm not prepared to give a date. What I would say is um, this, the 90 or the 60, there's not actually something that we view as hardwired in the statute. Uh, again, if you look at the effective date provision, um, at least at the staff level, we're reading it as giving us flexibility to put in place an implementation plan that works from all perspectives. And uh, of course, we're a little, uh, we still have a bit more proposing to do before we um, move into the adopting phase and the implementation phase. Um, but I, I take Adam's point about one, once we reach um, the, the appropriate point, uh, in giving some kind of tea date uh, seems to have a fair amount of merit to it. Stuart, from your international perspective, how is, uh, how is this U.S. implementation looking? I, I think uh, it, it is uh, it's, it's very complex. There are clearly uh, some deadlines are being missed. Uh, I think uh, a recent report by David Polk uh, said that about 5% of the rulemakings have been, have been completed yet and that most of the deadlines were able have been missed. Uh, so, but it is an incredibly complicated process, and I, I agree with uh, Senator Warner when he observed that, that in fact, uh, the, the industry had asked for that, for the regulators to do the regulating, not the legislators to do it. So having done that, it's not surprising to me that there would be uh, some delay. Uh, but if I, if I put it in the in international context, um, and uh, mention or talk a little bit about the Basel process, I think, you know, we have a lot tighter deadlines here in the U.S. than we would see for the Basel process. The, the international negotiations are referred to that accord, although they were incredibly rapid by international standards, being concluded basically within an 18-month time period, which is remarkable. Uh, we know that there's a phase in for that. It's basically from 2013 through 2019, uh, which is, to me, on the international, on the international level, quite worrisome. That's a long time. That's plenty of time for another financial crisis. And also the structure of the accord itself is, a, is although it's very robust and other people have mentioned it, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it is nonetheless a minimum. And uh, I think you, you see plenty of evidence of individual major markets and major regulators stepping a lot further and saying, well, this may be the minimum, but this is not what it's going to apply. And I come back to the derivatives briefly um, I, I, I agree that we need to get the, the, the standards agreed and a, uh, a clear sort of timetable going forward. And, and there is a need for a drive for consistency between the EU and the US, and particularly the UK and the US. And in this case, I think there's some evidence, at least, that, that the US is taking a tougher line on certain uh, extensions than the EU. And that's interesting and also of concern, particularly because clearly uh, getting derivatives on through uh, central theory is an essential part of 
minimizing or helping to minimize suspension of this going forward. Well, it is open on your request. It, it is. And I, I want to talk a bit more about uh, timing, uh, in particularly in the international perspective. Again, I go back to the G20 statement, year end 2012. Um, and uh, oddly enough, um, particularly on the international front, we've been getting um, some expressions of concern that we're moving too quickly here in the United States. Um, and obviously that's driven by our overseers here uh, in Congress uh, directing us to complete our tasks by uh, July 16th of um, 2011. Um, but, but I'd point out in terms of looking at where the EU is at, and I, I caveat this by saying that I am no expert on uh, the EU process. In fact, for those of you who know Schoolhouse Rock, and uh, I'm just a bill, I would love, I think that kind of Thompson Reuters own Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> but if they do, I would love a Schoolhouse Rock version for the EU process. So, uh, it's, it's been explained to me many, many times, and I'm either getting dumber as I get older, or I just, I just can't quite follow what the process is. But in any case, um, there, are, there are two major components, as I understand it, to the EU process. The first is the EMIR process, and that covers um, a portion of Dodd-Frank, which is the clearing piece and the trade repository piece. Um, and I believe it was September that the legislative proposal was put out last September, and it has not yet been, I don't even know the term, adopted yet at the equivalent of the congressional level here in the states. Um, the other part of, of so, so they haven't finished the, the, the legislative process yet in the EU. Once the legislative process is done, the, uh, the European regulators, the new ESMA, um, as well as the individual jurisdiction regulators are gonna be, the, be in the same place as the SEC and the CFTC was last July, meaning to implement the legislation. Um, so we're, we're almost mid-year 2011 and the legislation is not done yet. That's on the near side. The other piece of the European effort, and again, I'm no expert, is the MIFID, um, the MIFID reform. Um, and as I understand it, the MIFID reform is, is much less advanced. Um, and and the, the key part of the MIFID reform from a derivatives perspective is in the trading platform space. And in December, they put out, um, I believe it's a consultative paper is the term for it that they use. Um, so this is pre-legislative effort. It's uh, almost like a notice and comment process in the US context. So they have not yet started the real <coughs> legislative effort over there. Again. Um, this is in the context of the G20 commitment of a year-end 2012 deadline, not of regulatory implementation, but of actual results in the real world. Um, so I think in terms of thinking about timing both in the U.S. effort and the European effort, you have to think in that broader perspective and not just be focused, although it's very important for regulators, um, regulators here in the States on July 16th. I think that's fair, and I, I was quite surprised to hear the ambassador say that this will be in place hopefully by the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Now he's not here, and he wasn't speaking specifically about derivatives, but that end 2012 deadline is, uh, is looking slightly shaky, isn't it? Um, I, again, I can't speak on, on where the, the EU is. I would really turn to a, if there's an EU representative in the room to speak to uh, where they are in the process. <laughs> They can uh, stand up and pick themselves in a moment. Uh, Stuart, um, you, you have the, um, we're going to do the international panel later, so we're not going to delay for this point too much, but uh, just briefly, if you respond to Brian's talks, thoughts on the uh, European Monday. Well, I, I, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to go into the, the detail uh, on, on that. I think the, the, the next panel can, uh, can tackle that properly. Uh, but, but, I, but I do think, uh, uh, again, we, we need to make sure that the where there are inconsistencies, they don't really result in arbitrage. E even though uh, you know, that is a that's often argued, I mean, it's the standard argument that there will be arbitrage. But, uh, but, I, but I suspect that in the case of the derivatives market, that is fact. That is in fact. Let's let's ground ourselves back in the U.S., which is where we should be before I'm told off. And um, <laughs> Alan, let me hear a central question you, you dodged at the beginning. Uh, systemic risk designation, this is going to mean that uh, the largest uh, potentially private equity firms, largest asset managers, perhaps hedge funds might <coughs> face this new system where they get more regulation, they have to hold more capital. 
Um, are you expecting to be outside this, and how much of your time is spent uh, worrying about it? Well, I mean, speaking exactly what the specific regulation will say as to the criteria that will be used to determine who is and who is not susceptible to significant. And one of the very important um, arguments that, that I think has been made is that the designation, certainly among the large financial institutions, will essentially act as a sort of a, a ladder of full faith and guarantee of the U.S. government. In other words, will these institutions who are being designated as uh, significant from a systemic perspective, in fact, be incentivized or have financial incentives to act more risky? Because with the imprimatur behind them of being systemically significant, which could be read as too big to fail, will their cost of capital be lower? Will they have advantages in the marketplace? And will it incentivize risk-taking behavior? So you want to be in? <laughs> yeah, just to uh, say a couple things. First of all, while we don't know where the regulators are going to come out, the rulemaking that's been proposed really gives a great deal of discretion. The strong sense I have is that it will go along the lines of uh, how Governor Trudeau, in fact, was talking in a fairly recent speech again, which is to start relatively modestly in terms of designating the non bank SIFIs as those for which it's pretty obvious that they should be designated. And then maybe working out a bit from there. And then on the Adam's point, I would just say, well, I certainly agree that, that theoretically there's a moral hazard issue, that if you name an institution as a systemically important financial institution or SIFI, that people will see it as having the government automatically standing behind it in a serious crisis. I absolutely agree that it's a theoretical issue. It could distort behavior. But again, I just say realistically, if we had everybody in the room list who's systemically significant, you don't get A's. Okay? We know the core institutions, the market is already acting as if they're systemically important. Yes, there might be some on the edge, which is why you wouldn't all get a 100% on the final answer. There will be some around the edge, but they're not going to matter that much to the system as a whole. Which is why I don't know of a single institution that thinks it has a prayer of escaping being named in Mississippi who isn't trying their best to escape it. Because they see very little advantage and a great deal of regulatory disadvantage. Is this still on your list or not though? I certainly would prefer not to be designated. <laughs> Excellent. Um, let, let me talk about um, macro credential regulation, and uh, this was supposedly the new whizzy way of uh, preventing risks, tackling regulation the same way as monetary policy. Uh, let me turn to you, Stuart, um, because this is something that Group 30 has spent some time on and those written papers on. Are we actually approaching regulation in a different way? Are we looking at risks across the board rather than individual companies, individual silos? Are we actually seeing progress on that? I think we are. I think it is a new buzzword. Uh, three or four years ago, you, you, if you did a LexisNexis search, you wouldn't have seen any reference of macro financial policy whatsoever, at least in the Western uh, journals. And now it's all over the place. Of course, as, 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 as uh, Tom uh, mentioned, basically it is a, it's a refocusing on, on the system as a whole and not just on individual institutions. And much of what Basel III is doing or attempting to do is addressing those pieces. So it's the core capital level, 4.5%, then the additional conservation buffer of 2.5, then on top of that, this capital cyclical buffer that will vary between not zero and 2.5%, and then what they call in the Basel speak G cities or globally significant important financial institutions will also have to pull additional capital resources. So this is all an attempt, and, and in, addition, in addition to that, of course, you also have leverage ratio, the next stable funding ratio, and liquidity measure as well. All of these tools together are supposed to deal with this issue, which is getting a macro credential handle on the system as a whole and minimizing to a reasonable degree uh, the systemic risk that comes out of those uh, major institutions that we were just talking about. Whether we can do it uh, remains to be seen, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's some, some degree of, you know, it's, it's a contested contest, a concept, you know, let me put it that way. Uh, uh, former Governor Cohen said, you know, this is a, this is a theory, uh, you know, it, but it's yet to be practiced. Well, that may be the case in America, but it's certainly not the case elsewhere in the world. 
And if you look at Asian colleagues and Asian, Asian countries, uh, you see a lot of macroprudential policy already being practiced. It's just that we haven't chosen to do it. It doesn't mean it will be easy, however, because it's very difficult to step in, as we know, in the middle of a boom uh, to, to put the brakes off. Uh, but it, it's, it's clearly the new consensus, the new narrative within Basel, within the G20. This is something that will be actively attempted, and, and, it, and it ought to have major implications for the cities, because they will be pressed down on additional capital requirements in some countries as high as 19% in, in Switzerland, uh, which will, and ought to at least, limit their risk, because as you said, we know that they are in fact systemically dangerous to the system as a whole. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so just a couple of comments. First of all, towing the party line for a moment and suggest that Lexus Nexus can't help you. Perhaps you want to help me to talk about products. However, that, that aside, um, I think these issues of macronutrition regulation and more broadly all the alignment discussions we've had until now are important. What we need to do though is look at this not simply as a sprint to whatever the key is, but rather as a marathon. Because after the rules are enacted, there's a tremendous amount of work that has to go on after that fact. That work involves multiple tools, not only rules. Those tools start with budget, but they continue on to the actual information tools, enforcement tools, etc. that regulators need to actually regulate and enforce. And one of the things that we do with the Tom is obviously to meet with the regulators all over the world. One of the messages we hear is that they often don't have the very same tools that the market is so used to using in its everyday work. And therefore, as we think about not just forming the regulation, but what do we do to enable those regulations to come to life and be enforced, what we all need to do then is not keep an eye only on T, but what happens after that day to make sure the regulators are well positioned to enforce these rules and expand them over time should that be necessary. That's one comment. The second comment that I'd like to make is, notwithstanding the fact that there's a later panel on international issues, let's call this one quasi-international but quasi-domestic, which goes to the question of New York Stock Exchange winter. While we're all taking our time, and I'm not saying it's a lengthy amount of time, I think it's a fair amount of time, but we're taking our time to put the rules in place, there are two very major international players that are changing the of business as we speak. And that merger, in fact, both those mergers, the Deutsche Bank and the NASDAQ, ISBIT, are all about the derivatives business. And so the market's getting ahead of where the regulators are at. And therefore, I think what we should do is think a little bit, not, not only about Title VII and its European equivalents, but where's the market taking us in the meantime? And when the market's going is straight to the heart of the derivatives are changing, it's a really exciting business, notwithstanding the amount of regulatory uncertainty. And we want to do our best to do the convergence thing that the regulators are working on in parallel, but we want to do it on our terms, which is market-driven solution in tandem with regulatory solution. Yeah. If I could just jump in, I, I want to first of all agree with you that really what it's about is not just the signing of the accord and, and then you have a very lengthy uh, you know, uh, facing period, it's, it's how it's being applied in every case. Are the countries applying the, the, the agreed levels in consistent ways that provide for uh, reasonable uh, certainty, as it were, for the, for the, for the major firms and deliver the macroprudential stability that we're looking for? And it's not clear that that's the case. There's plenty of evidence that, in fact, that is not taking place. And we have to bear in mind as well that there are no enforcement mechanisms in the Basel process. Within the EU context, that's different. But within the Basel process, there aren't any. All that happens is people get around, they look at a report, and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm being a little bit uh, sarcastic, but they look at the report, they say, well, you know, is, this, is country X doing this? Oh, it doesn't look as if it's doing it. But there's no way in which you can actually force a country that has decided not to apply the, the, the standards appropriately to do so, which is a major problem, but that's an institutional problem that hasn't been addressed uh, by the process. Uh, I just want to address one point on the merger. And first off, I, I don't want to touch the political issue at all. Um, at all. Uh, I just want to make a technical point on the merger, and this is sometimes lost in, in um, the, talking about these kinds of issues. I'd also point out that um, it's not an area that I'm responsible for in our division. It's our Office of Market Supervision, so I'm not involved in this at all. The technical point is that when, when you talk about mergers, either domestic or international, um, you're not talking about changing how the actual exchange platforms are regulated. So a number of years ago, as you all know, um, NYSE and Euronext, Euronext being a European-based entity, um, merge, and so it's now a combined entity, NYSC Euronex. Um, that merger did not change the way the SEC regulated NYSC 
on Wall Street. It did not change the way, at least from my understanding, the way that the Europeans regulated the Euronext platforms. And I think that's an important, just very techno technical point to keep in mind uh, when we talk about transatlantic or transpacific uh, mergers in uh, regulated industries. Uh, it's it's a, a holding company level issue. It's not a how the specific market and specific jurisdiction is regulated type of issue. This raises an um, issue of resolution authority, and we've had problems all over the world with how to wind down a failing bank from Ireland to Iceland to here. Um, and I'm slightly concerned that we don't actually have something that the market thinks is credible, and we see that the rating agencies have not removed the uh, government subsidy they apply to the largest banks here, the largest uh, non-bank institutions, uh, who were going through bankruptcy. Uh, Doug, I'd like to ask you how uh, how you feel the resolution authority is being developed and whether you think it represents a credible tool to wind down ARG or Lehman Brothers. Uh, certainly. First of all, let me give a 15 second ad since macro credential was mentioned. I've been doing a fair amount of work in that area. I just want to mention I have an extensive primer for a non specialist audience on what macro credential policy is, if anyone is inspired to read that based on the discussion. Forgive me, I read it last night and it was very good, and I meant to mention you along with the uh, Ariel. Um, even better, that was not a paid endorsement. <laughs> uh, okay, in terms of, of resolution, to, to be blunt, I think that Dodd Frank was a considerable step forward in dealing with small and medium sized financial crises, the ones we have every few years, every 10, 15, 20 years. I worry that it was actually a step backwards to some extent on the type of crisis we may have, say, every 50 years, the type of thing we just went through. Because the reason I think it works well for smaller and medium-sized financial crises is because it gives the regulators the tools to deal with non-banks. And there are many important non-banks that are key parts of the system. So that is a distinct step forward. But because of the fear of being accused of setting up a future bailout, a fear that reached a level of paranoia, I think, by the end of the legislative process, um, they set it up so that it's very hard to do anything except take one of those institutions and then destroy them afterwards. Um, I'm probably putting it too strongly, but the idea is you basically take them and then you liquidate them. Um, that probably works fine if there are very few institutions that you have to do that to at a given time. But in a widespread financial crisis, you're not going to want to create the massive credit crunch that would result from taking many important institutions simultaneously and putting them through liquidation. Because even though the theory is you would take the good parts the part, and the parts that were doing truly essential activities and you kind of treat them differently, I can assure you as a former banker, if I were at one of those institutions going through that process, I would effectively stop making new loans. Because it would become extremely risky to do anything for a period of time with everyone watching over you and not knowing who's going to own you farther down the line and probably you're looking for a job anyway. So <laughs> all those things taken together, and plus the Fed's 13-3 powers, that is, their powers to loan to non-banks and non-financial institutions were restricted considerably by Dodd-Frank. It has to now be offered on a wide basis, a sector or an industry or a type of instrument, rather than the ability to step in. Um, so for example, if the right answer had been to rescue Lehman, which I personally think it would have been, I'm sure there would have been a very substantial Fed role in that. We won't have that option going forward, at least without perverting the intent of Dodd Frank. So I think what we've done is to take care of the small and medium sized crisis, but say for a really big crisis, you're on your own, make a new tarp, and move really, really quickly. And I want to jump in, I want to ask you as well how uh, destabilizing the Lehman Flats was, um, perhaps for your business, but more generally, and then also how you think um, Citadel, I'm sure this will never happen, would be able to wind itself down. Right. I mean, just I guess if there's a threat of a systemic significant issue in there, again, I, you know, if you asked me at the beginning, how will we um, on the reporting and, and registration? The reporting machine really provides the regulators and it's designed to provide the regulators an opportunity to monitor uh, the entities within the system and in order to determine what the 
does it mean to be interconnected? What does it mean to be significant to the economy? What does it mean to be leveraged? What kind of structure should we? So the reporting regime and data is, I think, pretty important. Um, I just commented on that uh, one of the points Doug made did stop making loans. And I think it will also make it incredibly difficult for those firms to raise capital in the marketplace because nobody understands it anymore what used to be the sort of tried and true uh, uh, sort of priority of creditors within the capital structure. If the intent of the interpretation of the is to respect the bankruptcy, bankruptcy code and regime, which I believe is right there in the statute, it says just a few paragraphs down, and we'll do so until we decide not to do so. And there's enormous discretion granted to the um, authorities to sort of um, disregard the priority of creditors, which means how those instruments are priced and the uncertainty of, that those who supply capital will bring to the pricing of those instruments will uh, ultimately almost create a self and possibly part of those companies that need capital the most to raise capital in a cost effective way. So if I can just add one thing to what the panelists have said, those who wrote the resolution of voting sections are clearly not in their global bankruptcy. If you actually study what happened in the Lehman case, the complexity of what happened, not just in the US, but in London, what you recognize is that you don't want to go through liquidation for a host of reasons. Um, and what the, what the panelists have said so far is prior to liquidation is going to make life very complex, and new liquidation will make life even more complex, not only for that institution, but for the entire place. And so the other thing uh, that we take from Lehman is yes, the derivatives portfolio of the bankruptcy was horribly messy. We're still unwinding and we'll be unwinding for years and years and years. Lehman's proprietary futures portfolio was on the loan cleanly with no money lost in seven hours. Why? Because it was essentially clear portfolio. What impact did it have on Citadel? What impact did it have on the marketplace? It has taught us in very stark terms the significance of having centrally clear portfolios and to get rid of the buy bilaterals or over the counter system risk that it exists in the old structure. Do we, do we have any confidence and uh, hope for the financial stability oversight council which is supposed to bring all the regulators together and provide this macro prudential view of the world and do the systemic designations and, and be the body that's incorporated this new world of regulation? Senator Warner suggested that with some, uh, he had some problems with how it was working out. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? <coughs> I think it's an absolutely essential part of the new uh, superstructure, as it were, not having uh, a, a body which can uh, raise serious issues related to potential future systemic risk or unfolding crises, which we essentially didn't have before, before 2008, 2009, was extremely damaging. But, uh, so, so that's very important, and I would also uh, note that every other major market already has that type of structure. Each European uh, country must have what's known as a financial stability committee. And Canada has one that works extremely well. And it's, it's at least one reason why they were able to avoid the, the most severe effects of the crisis. However, having said that, there seems to be a sense uh, that the FSOC is growing in size. More and more people are saying, well, how about me? Why can't I be, I be in the committee as well, including uh, in industry representatives, which is fine and dandy, but if this organization is supposed to be discussing potentially potentially sensitive, confidential, very serious matters in the run up to a crisis, size and uh, size and inclusiveness are not necessarily what you want. You want a small organization where people can speak frankly and put their cards on the table and then make a decision quickly. If the organization becomes too much like a very large committee with multiple subcommittees and everybody's invited, then you basically negate the, eff the efficacy of the organization. And what, what will happen is people will go and have those discussions bilaterally instead. So. Yeah, if I could just uh, associate myself with those remarks, I, I very largely agree. Uh, I think a better model would have been what the British are doing, which is they're setting up a financial policy committee that's associated with, but not completely dominated by the Bank of England. Um, I do worry, I, look, I think the FSOC will be a significant improvement on not having anybody come in this role. But I think we need to find uh, a very focused way of making sure 
that we deal with the issues, and there is a real worry about it becoming very diffused. Looking from the rest of the world into the U.S., should we still have confidence that uh, regulation, re-regulation is proceeding in the right direction? We now, as the Senator alluded to, have several empty chairs at the top of the agency, so soon to be the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, already the Consumer Agency, uh, the Office of Financial Research has not had anyone appointed to it, uh, the Office of Control of the Currency operates with an acting head. Uh, in addition, the Republicans obviously took the House of Representatives, and although there are only a um, uh, few attempts to repeal the bill, there are plenty of attempts to unpick it. Um, should we, are we still confident that regulation is moving in the right direction? Yeah, I, I basically am. Yeah. What, what, what I've said before is between Dodd-Frank and Basel III, I think we're getting to maybe two-thirds of the way where we ought to be. But in the real world, is a, is a, a real step forward. The things you're describing make it harder to get all the way there. And I certainly agree with the earlier comments about the importance of the kind of post-implementation things, actually having the budget of the right people, et cetera. All, all that is important, and it's put a bit at risk. But I think the world uh, will be a lot better off in a few years than where we were before this last crisis, even though we can all point to a number of things that could be done better. Just, just one comment to add, and again, I, I agree. Um, we tend to talk a lot about regulation. We tend to leave off the word enforcement, and the rules are only as good as the people who can actually enforce them. And in this case, I would certainly sympathize with Brian and other, others um, in the regulatory community who aren't being given the tools that they need to really be able to enforce everything that we're looking for them to enforce. And these new rules, I agree, will get us to a better place, with one caveat, which is that there's somebody around to enforce them the day after the election. I, I, I agree with uh, both of the uh, previous speakers. I think we have, we have gone uh, a considerable way. This is, Basel III is a massive improvement. We're talking about many multiples of what the capital we previously had. We're talking about the, the definition of capital being significantly tightened in a way that will make those institutions, or ought to make those institutions much more robust. Nonetheless, we do, it would, it would, it would be worrisome if if the actual national level implementation wasn't done in an effective manner. I'm, I'm not that worries me to a certain degree. I, what I what worries me more perhaps is that this current, the current regulators, the supervisors and central bankers who lived through the crisis, if remember it, they, they worked too many hours all night every night to get through it. They have no doubt, I am sure, about the seriousness of this this issue and the seriousness of this re-regulation and the need for it. So I don't think that the current crop of supervisors and regulators are going to give up the ghost and stop uh, enforcing a stricter system uh, at, the, at the current moment. I don't think that's the case. I think they'll do what is necessary to uh, strengthen the system. What worries me is where you have a situation perhaps a little bit down the line where supervisors, particularly in countries that were so much affected by the crisis, uh, perhaps don't remember explicitly what was going on. I mean, uh, just a, an aside and an example of that is, is that it's rather interesting that we have a dynamic in the United Kingdom where the new government didn't really live in a, a governmental way through the crisis. And therefore their vigor, as it were, regulatorily and as I said, looking at central banking and, and re-regulating the UK markets is much less uh, notice, noticeable uh, because they didn't experience it and they came, came, to, came to the table with totally different views. And so that, that, that's an example of, of where, I, where I'm slightly more worried is if people forget or they, they, they decide to uh, put aside the lessons we should have learned. Brian, Ellie uh, alluded to your um, budgetary restrictions, and we can perhaps have a collection at the end for the SEC. So <laughs> how, um, and the Chen Shapiro has said that it's affecting you in a variety of ways, it will affect you in the future. How is it specifically affecting your and as you um, think about writing these rules and then implementing them. I guess, I mean, this, uh, to use a Washington phrase, is way above my pay grade. Um, uh, but to quote or paraphrase Bagger Vance, we're doing, or we're trying to do the best we can with what we've got. Um, we've been given an enormous task. Um, uh, again, Title VII, I'm speaking about derivatives and uh, the, the Title VIII uh, clearing and settlement provisions. Um, uh, and a host of other Dodd-Frank provisions in my division of trading and markets. Um, we're not only doing um, Dodd-Frank implementation, we've got the exchange merger that was mentioned earlier, we've got
about flash crash, uh, your continuing work uh, post flash crash. Um, we oversee clearing agencies. We oversee exchanges on a day to day basis. We oversee um, we oversee uh, broker dealers and a host of other um, a host of other uh, reg regulatory functions. We obviously work with our colleagues in enforcement um, and in our office of compliance inspections and examinations. Our boots on the ground. The division of trading and markets um, represents about 5% or so of uh, the SEC. SEC has something like 3,000 uh, 3, staff overall. Um, and so it's that, that group of, of folks in trading and markets that has a significant amount of, of, um, of responsibility. And again, we're doing, uh, we're doing the best we can with uh, what we've got to work with. Thanks very much. Have we got any questions? There's a significant technology investment as well as, of course, the actual cost of sourcing the data to make this come alive. And if you talk to people who are engaged in this business, getting the same level of market overview that many on um, private trader floors come to, come to expect is an extremely expensive process. That's why investment banks and funds privately invest so much money in this. And if we're looking for this office to solve all these problems, what is using data to use comms expression? But we all need to understand, again, going to the enforcement point, that this isn't just about writing the rules. It's the government being willing to continue to invest to allow, in this case, the SEC to succeed with this because it's an expensive and, uh, and an extended process. Adam, um, the data that you're now having to um, produce, um, is this a, a sort of significant investment in resources for you? I mean, obviously, uh, Citadel is one of the world's top hedge funds. You're, um, you're not uh, unable to invest in such things, but is it uh, management and, and resource constraint? Well, I think first and foremost, it's not clear exactly what the data is. Those rules are still being finalized. And it's easy to say we want information on your leverage or liquidity. But those terms may mean different, do mean different things to different participants in the marketplace. So the first and most important, I think, uh, issue is let's have consistency among definitions. Uh, secondly, the, the sort of proposed form PF uh, proposal really will uh, differentiate, you know, the larger participants in the marketplace will more readily be able to produce the information because they will have the systems and the resources to do so. The smaller firms will not. The, the, the differentiating factor now, I think, is sort of a, a billion dollars under management is where the tipping point is in terms of frequency and scope of, of reporting. So, you know, there needs to be a lot of thought given to how will it impact the billion dollar engine versus perhaps a more rational, you know, of, of, of marker like five billion dollars. If everybody's going to have to invest in retooling systems, or in some cases, uh, uh, developing them from scratch. You know, it, it goes back a lot of the, uh, you mentioned a moment ago, a lot of the seats are asked to be, a lot of the rules are yet to be written. Um, our, the same issue applies here. Whenever there is certainty, our industry, the financial industry, can uh, attack it with great resources and great energy and solve for it. But when there is uncertainty, markets that operate as efficiently, firms don't operate as efficiently, and, and we're sort of in this limbo period that's making that constructive. Uh, and Brian, I was going to let you off the hook on this, but I see that uh, you might be keen to address it, which is, Senator uh, Warner um, talked about the jockeying between the CFTC and the SEC, he was disappointed in that. Um, is that the reality? Are you, are you playing nicely? How's it going? First off, I've, I've been accused. I think um, the ambassador talked about glass half full, glass half empty, and full glass. And I've been accused on this issue of being a full glass kind of guy for months now. Um, the context in which I come to this is 12 years in Washington, started in '98 at the SEC, and lived through the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. I spent a year on that piece of legislation, um, which set forth the framework that we currently have for for swaps and that Dodd Frank addressed. It also had Title II, which is the security futures uh, provisions, which was uh, something that was heavily negotiated between the SEC and the CFTC um, over many, many months, and I spent a year of my life uh, doing that. So I feel like I'm a veteran of, of um, uh, SEC, CFTC. Uh, uh, not not true. I mean, um, SEC and CFTC engagement on policy issues over the last 12 years. It didn't end with CFMA. I have dealt with um, dealt with jurisdictional issues, which side of the line products fall on, for a lot of my career at the SEC. Um, and I've got to say, these last um, 
last uh, nine months. Um, I wouldn't want to repeat it, but not because of the CFTC. It's just been a long, it's been a long slog trying to get through through Dodd Frank. But I've got to say that um, I, I am, uh, you know, in context. I, I think um, we have worked pretty well together. Um, you know, the, we we just finished the product definitions, which is really ground zero of of SEC CFTC. Um, uh, 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 discussions and um, the, the proposing release came out about 98% in agreement on issues. I don't know how many of you are married in the audience, but I'm not <laughs> sure that there is a you know there's there's a couple out there that that agrees 98% of the time. It took us nine months. We had really um, good discussions. We had some challenging moments. We had that in a lot of areas in implementing Title VII, <coughs> but we are working well together. Um, to try to address um, the issues. Again, no challenges, but, but we're, I think there's good faith on both sides. I'm sure my colleague Jackie can, uh, Jackie Mesa can, on, on the next panel, can, can um, uh, echo that. I think the other benefit, and this really cuts across FSOC, um, SEC, CFTC, and um, also the European um, angle, uh, we're working very closely, both on a bilateral basis and um, on a multilateral basis with our colleagues in Europe. Um, uh, SEC staff is on a number of work streams um, involving the FSOC, um, and then, of course, the SEC CFTC effort to implement Title VII. In all of these, it's providing an opportunity to really build strong relationships. I know so many more people in Europe that I can pick up the phone and call if I have a question today than I did a year and a half ago. We, we've it's almost a uh, kind of a, a we happy few. We've gone through a lot together, SEC, CFTC, in the context of the Financial Stability, the Stability Board Working Group, the IOSCO Task Force, um, the, the FSOC. We've gone through a lot working together towards a common goal, and that has built really positive relationships at all levels in these organizations across Europe, United States, and then domestically in the United States. So I'm in the last pretty full kind of guy on this. And on that happy note, um, thank you very much to Adam, to Doug, to Brian, to Stuart and to Lily. Thanks very much.